Uh, Lakers mass on full display last night. Uh, you know, a little tire fire on the interstate last night. Um, just doesn't work. A little bit of a raise in the white flag at the trade deadline, perhaps. AD's not healthy. Westbrook now is no longer even productive. Uh, LeBron is playing pretty well the last night. I'm not sure his health. He doesn't he didn't quite look springy. Uh, Bill Oram covers the Lakers for The Athletic. He's covered them for a long time, almost a decade. And he wrote an article uh, near the trade deadline, fully sourced, that LeBron did not like. And uh, LeBron sent a tweet out either last night or this morning referencing Bill and LeBron actually had a conversation. And, uh, you know, LeBron's always been pretty good with the media. Like, he'll, 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 you know, he talks after games. He's not one of these guys that LeBron doesn't hide. I mean, to his credit, not all stars are great post-game and pre-game, and some can be petty. LeBron's always been pretty good with the media. So here's the tweet, uh, Bill Oram at The Athletic. So LeBron said, listen, I had a candid conversation after the game. I know he has a job to do. I know that what he wrote wasn't truthful because it never came from me, but I get it. Sources run this game. Nevertheless, Laker Nation, uh, let him be because he ain't a bad guy. All right, so I'm not going to ask you uh, specific details of the conversation. Um But let's take our audience back and contextualize it. He was upset because of an article written that was fully sourced. Give our audience a sense of what that article entailed that LeBron was not happy about. Well, LeBron hasn't expressed to me specifically what he was, um, what he was upset about or what he's refuting. But, you know, I think, you know, I think the tone of the coverage and not just from me, not just from the athletic, really since his comments over the all-star break have, have sort of, interpreted what he said about potentially returning to Cleveland, leaving that door open, wanting to play with Bronny, complimenting, you know, various executives, you know, other than Lakers GM Rob Palinka, as him trying to exert some leverage on the Lakers organization after they didn't make a deal at the trade deadline, after the roster that's been put together around him, you know, obviously not without his influence, hasn't worked. So um, I think in general, LeBron is pushing back on the idea that his comments were anything other than at face value. Hey, I do like Kobe Altman. I do like Sam Presti. That doesn't mean I'm, I'm not down with Rob Palenka right now. Me wanting to potentially leave the door open to Cleveland doesn't mean I'm not committed to the Lakers. And what that asks us to do as, you know, critically thinking, you know, members of the media, you know, Lakers fans, people who followed LeBron James for these last 19 years is to trust that he's not like, you know, trying to move pieces behind the scenes, that this isn't calculated when we know LeBron who is, you know, a basketball genius, but also a very, very savvy operator in other ways, uh, you know, in terms of manipulating things in his favor, is not trying to get a certain message across. And I, I think really what you've seen over the last 10 days or so is LeBron realizing that, you know, this has gotten a little more out of hand than he expected. In this yeah. media environment, there was a lot more pushback on some of his comments and and, and um, interpretation to some of his comments than there might have been when he was in Cleveland and things were going kind of sideways. We're just in a different media landscape now. And, you know, I believe that he felt it was important to sort of lower the temperature because yeah. you did see where Rich Paul needed to meet with Jeannie Buss and Rob Palinka to sort of uh, re-establish that connection to say LeBron's committed to the Lakers. Um, you know, he's not looking to make a change with the front office. You know, just lower the temperature after the, after the way his comments sort of lit the NBA world on fire. Uh, over All-Star Weekend. So that's sort of where we are. But what I've written is really just the fact that LeBron, to me, over All-Star break, really sent a message to the Lakers that you know his presence isn't guaranteed, that there can be an expiration date to his this Lakers adventure if he doesn't feel like he's being taken care of. And you know it makes sense that he would then ease that pressure once he feels like that message has been received. Um, listen, it's pretty well understood in NBA circles. They had a deal for Buddy Heald. LeBron wanted Westbrook. He's not an off-ball player. It's been a disaster. Now he's yapping at fans. He's ripping people out for the games. It's a mess. Whatever. So ideally, you'd like to move off Westbrook. Uh, I've said before, I, if you told me the future of the Lakers was LeBron, Malik Monk, um, I'd probably put Reeves, Avery Bradley. I, I'm not an AD guy. I, I understand I'm in the minority. Everybody loves him. I would have moved off him last year. Uh, but whatever. I guess my takeaway, Bill, is how do you solve stuff? I don't care about finger pointing. Like, how do you solve stuff? I do think they've waved a white flag for this year. I, I just think they're not going to win. So let's move on. Do you think Westbrook's the easiest player to move, but you'd have to inherit some bad contracts to give up him? I mean, like, what's the solution in your, is there is there one? 
I think there has to be one, right? There has to be a move made with Westbrook, barring something just unimaginable. Right. You know, him, you know, suddenly being very proactive and saying he's willing to come off the bench or, you know, just a complete, um, you know, reversal in kind of the way he views himself. Uh, just because, like you said, this has not worked. Um, you know, I've written previously that trading for Russell Westbrook is going to go down as one of the worst management decisions in the history of the modern, of the modern history of the NBA. Um, especially when you consider what where the Lakers were and where they should be with LeBron and Anthony Davis, um, and then you bring in Russell Westbrook, which has just been a, a total disaster. Um, you know, you're going to have two draft picks this summer, two first round draft picks for 2027 and 2029. So, you know, far off, right? But you can use those to incentivize, you know, getting getting someone else to take the last year of Russ's $45, $48 million contract. Um, and you're going to take back somebody else's money, but that might at least be players who fit a little bit better alongside LeBron, guys who are comfortable playing more of a role alongside LeBron and Anthony Davis. And then you're going to be in the same position where you are building it out with minimum contracts again. I mean, you mentioned Malik Monk. I don't see a scenario where the Lakers can afford Malik Monk. He's been too good. Yeah. So he's going to get a payday from someone else. All the Lakers are going to have is that tech taxpayer mid-level exception, which is around $5 million. That's a massive underpay for for Malik Monk. And I don't think Malik Monk, who should be, you know, you know, basically on his you know rookie extension at this point, if things had gone better in Charlotte, is going to be looking to give anybody a, um, you know, a, you know, a hometown discount. So to me, uh, Malik Monk, you know, has been able to resurrect his career with the Lakers, but I don't see him sticking around. So now really the Lakers are going to rearrange the, the, the big pieces again, right? They're going to try to find a way to move off of Westbrook, you know, I don't see anything changing with LeBron or Anthony Davis just because, I mean, in part, Anthony Davis has been hurt so much. Yeah. You're going to get not the same value you would have if you had been looking to trade him a year ago, which they absolutely were not. Um, but now you, the first two years of that five-year max extension have basically been completely derailed by injuries. Yeah. You've got three years left on that contract and one more year of injuries, and then now a, a majority of that contract has been wasted. So, I mean, that's really unfortunate for a player who is – you know, obviously as skilled and supremely talented as Anthony Davis has is, but hasn't been able to be on the court the last two years for the Lakers. So that's really unfortunate. But you're invested in this, in this at least this duo. Anthony Davis and LeBron James still represent your best path to being a contender. And so I think that they're going to have to, you know, really try to, you know, go at it again and learn from the lessons of this season. And what's been interesting about the Lakers and Rob Palinka, as long as they've had LeBron James, has been these annual reversals of strategy you know the first year yes. they thought that they could sur surround lebron james with ball handlers that didn't work yep. so then they go and get shooters and defenders and that does work but then they outsmart themselves and think well we don't need javel <laughs> mcgee we need marcus Saul. we need Mont montrez harrow we don't need danny green we need dennis Schroeder. and so you take the the one time it actually worked you still completely overhauled that roster and then this year last year you said hey we had too many role players we didn't have enough you know we didn't have enough um star power, enough leadership, enough like, you know, you know, tent pole talent. And so then you go out and get Russell Westbrook, who makes, I mean, like, I, I hate piling on with Russell Westbrook because I still think he's one of the best basketball players in the world, but is not aging as gracefully as some other people like LeBron James yeah. and is a terrible fit here, um, has made the Lakers demonstrably worse. Um, so the Lakers haven't had an identity around LeBron James over these four years, a consistent identity. And I see them probably you know, changing course again this summer and having an overreaction to this year, as opposed to, you know, having a roadmap, you know, over these four years to be kind of a consistent team. Yeah. Well, the NBA, you got to have matching contracts. So if you get rid of Westbrook, some people have suggested the Knicks, you take Evan Fournier, you take a couple of Knicks players. Fournier can shoot a little bit that I like. Um, well, okay. Bill Orem, the athletic, uh, follow, read him. He's got up-to-date stuff. And occasionally make stars uncomfortable, which is always a good sign of a journalist. <laughs> Bill, thanks again. Thanks, Colin. All right, little update on where they are right now. It is he made a really good point. They just every year it's a different team. They just keep kind of grasping, 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 grasp. And it worked once when they had that little bubble. It did work. Well, that's that is the other part that feels like the issue with the Lakers. What are they? What is the identity of the Lakers? Hi, everybody. Thanks for watching. Subscribe here to get the latest from the show. Also, be sure to check out more of the best clips from The Herd or go watch a few segments from other shows on FS1.